You're listening to Revenge of the Drive-In from the Grandma Sophia's Podcast Network. This is the podcast where we watch and discuss two drive-in movies randomly selected from a list of over 2,000. This week's episode is on Planet of the Apes, the original 1968 classic, and The Giant Spider Invasion, the 1975 very, very not classic film. I am your host, Patrick, and I am joined by a returning special guest, Sean, who was featured on the Godzilla Raids Again and Killing American Style episode. It's great to be here again. It's it's been a while. We didn't mention this last time because the podcast didn't exist yet, but you are a co-host of a podcast on similar types of movies. Uh, It's Well, I'll let you explain the name of it because the name's confusing to me because it changes Sure. So sometimes we're Monster Club. That was our original plan, although it turned out there were a couple other Monster Clubs in existence. Oh, that makes sense. So we're Monster Club with a trademark symbol behind it, um, but because the trademark symbol is sometimes unsearchable, because it's a weird, uh, you know, it's a non-standard text, we're right. also sometimes Monster Club Lunch Break Hot Takes. Um, okay. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, uh, Amazon, pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts. Have you ever gone by Monster Club Service Mark? No, or no, no, no. any of the other? No, we could, Monster Club Restricted, no. Yeah, there you go. Okay, Monster Club uh, re- Restricted sounds like <laughs> like Monster Club After Dark, like you do some like dirty movies or something Oh, like well, that. actually, our very first movie was like a softcore porn. Yeah, Dinosaur Island, right? Yeah, Dinosaur Island. And we just did our one-year anniversary episode on Tammy and the T-Rex, which ends with a kind of disconcerting strip tease by Denise Richards, considering yes. she's supposed to be a high school student in the... The movie so well we've got more underage nudity in the giant spider invasion <laughs> i guess although uh, to be fair she looks 30 but <laughs> yes uh. <laughs> you know it's it's something to do with the b movies um oh yeah and we should of course note obviously this will come up but giant spider invasion is well remembered as a mystery science theater 3000 episode it's also well remembered as a movie shot in rural wisconsin which is my home state i am Currently enjoying a Point Special Lager from the Stevens Point Brewery, which Stevens Point is about an hour from Gleason, Wisconsin, which is where the movie's shot, so it's probably the nearest brewery that's going to sell stuff anywhere near me to Gleason, so... Exciting. Yes. <laughs> you know, I've been, to, I've been to Wisconsin twice. I drove through it on two different road trips. There you go. And on the one, I stopped at the Deke Slayton Astronaut and Bicycle Museum, which I, is a yeah. great thing if you're ever in the state. Okay. <laughs> Where the hell is that? I've never heard of it. Um, well, Deke Slayton was one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts. And okay. His hometown was somewhere in Wisconsin. I'm going to quick look while we're talking about it. Astronaut and Bicycle Museum? Yeah, they, told, they, they claimed it was a museum of transportation. Oh. Um, it was a bicycle museum, and then I think Deke Slayton <laughs> gave a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> to the museum. So I it's actually the... It's the Deke Slayton Memorial Space and Bicycle Museum in Sparta, Wisconsin. Okay, I've heard of Sparta. I'm not sure how close it is to me or how close <laughs> it is to Gleason, but I have heard of it. Um, that's exciting. <laughs> I, I, I do love me some like niche, like weirdo museums. I haven't yeah. been to many. You know, here in Wisconsin, I know we have the Bobblehead Museum somewhere in Milwaukee, which I've never been to, but it sounds up that kind of alley if you're if you're interested <laughs> yeah. in those things. And actually, it's, it even relates to this episode since both of our movies are you know space themed this week. So. Right, and I'm sure there are Planet of the Apes bobbleheads out there somewhere. <laughs> oh, but... probably. Oh, I meant the space, the space. <laughs> no, I know, no, I know. Oh, yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, that's true. I just, I want a giant spider head and a uh, giant spider invasion bobblehead. I don't know. I guess Alan Hale, maybe Alan Hale and his Ooh, pit maybe. stains. Yeah, or you could make a spider one with some pipe cleaners, probably. Yeah, you could probably make one that looks better than the spiders in this movie. <laughs> yeah. 20th Century Fox transforms the motion picture screen into Planet of the Apes. So all that having been said, we're we're going to start with Planet of the Apes, the movie that was made with a real budget, with real Hollywood money, real Hollywood actors. Charlton Heston is, uh, I looked him up, he's about 45 years old in this movie. He's, I guess you could say past his prime, but he's not, he's far from washed up. And I think maybe this could 
be uh, maybe a bit of a renaissance for Heston, kind of reinventing himself as an actor because he does Silent Green a few years later. He does the Omega Man. Mm-hmm. So he was kind of in this little sci-fi kick, I guess, in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, considering he had started in kind of the uh, sword and sandal type. Yeah, movies. the epic movies. I mean, this is very different than that, but it's also not that different because he's wearing a loincloth and he's running around shirtless that's, that's a lot. That's true, so. actually. No, it, it does really kind of flow together. A great many people worked long and hard to answer the question of what a civilization would be like where the evolutionary process had been reversed and apes were the superior species. Hundreds of technicians and the largest number of makeup artists ever assembled assisted the producers, the writers, the director, and the cast. Dr. Cornelius Roddy McDowell. Dr. Zira is played by Kim Hunter. Dr. Zayas is portrayed by Maurice Evans. And Nova by Linda Harrison. So, Charlton Heston plays the character of Taylor. He is an astronaut who we first meet flying out in space. He's the only crew member who's awake. And he's lamenting, well, he, he's talking about how, I guess they've traveled through time. And that was the intention of this mission, to test out some theory of space-time or whatever. And he's he's lamenting on, like, you know, what's going on on Earth. Like, is it still violent and uncaring and stuff? And it's kind of like on-the-nose dialogue, but it's also, it establishes this sort of social commentary and this is, of course, a script co-written by Rod Serling, creator of The Twilight Zone, the arguably the greatest writer in television history. Didn't write a whole lot of movies. You know, the, you, you can certainly feel his influence on this movie. I don't know, because he's one of two listed writers, and the, and the film's also based on a novel by Pierre Boulet, or Boulle, the French author who also wrote The Bridge on the River Kwai. And so I don't know what specifically is Serling here and what isn't. Mm. I do know the twist ending is Rod Serling and it feels very Rod Serling. It feels yeah, very it does, Twilight Yeah, it does feel, feel very Twilight Zone, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, this stuff here, this feels, even the opening with the, the kind of social commentary being established early, this feels a little Rod Serling to me too, even though I think it is a little on the nose. Yeah, it definitely starts with a lot of um, exposition kind of explaining where we are. And I mean, clearly, you know, they're doing a lot of commentary on the state of the world in 1968 at that point. Although it's 1972, I think, in the movie. They oh, put is it, it? It's one of those movies that starts, for some reason, it's a little bit in the future, I guess, to make this space travel just a little bit more realistic, <laughs> yeah. but also not really. they need to really. go further out than four years, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We got to the moon in 69, but in 72, we got beyond the solar system, I guess. You <laughs> yes, know. yeah. Really sped things up. After he goes into cryo sleep, the members of the crew are awakened because the ship is crash landing into a lake in the middle of the desert. And they see that one of the crew members has died. And so the three remaining ones, that's Taylor, that's Landon, and that's Dodge all escape onto a raft and before leaving they find that the air is breathable and that it is the year 3978 according to their computer or whatever 1960s computer the very analog (laughs) computer world which is something that this has in common with the second film that was one of my one of the things i enjoyed about the giant spider invasion the amount of times they spent in those ugly ugly computer lab type locations oh yeah i always enjoy when you see the giant spinning tapes too Mm -hmm. that really dates certain things. Happens to Mm -hmm. a lot of sci-fi of the 60s and 70s. So the three surviving crew members journey through the desert, seeking life. These scenes really take their time, and they try to establish character. I don't think the character establishment really works that well, because it's a lot of... Landon is, like, the really... I guess you could say positive one, but he's the one who's also, like, most distraught about them being where they are and about how everyone he he knows has been dead for thousands of years. Taylor, Charlton Heston, is like the really cynical one, and they're, they're trying to like figure out why he went on this mission, and overall I just didn't think this was that important. And especially it's kind of weird because they don't do anything to establish Dodge as a character, who's the, the black guy, which is a little unfortunate, but yeah, it's just, there's a lot of character establishment that doesn't really work well, but I do think these scenes overall work well because... I mean, they're shooting in the desert, which we've seen in a bunch of science fiction movies and television. 
mm-hmm. to look like alien worlds, and it and it never looks a hundred percent right because it always looks like an Earth desert. There's that constant running joke too. I think it originally goes back to Star Trek, but like how the fact that yeah, Trek. most most science fiction planets look an awful lot like Southern California, exactly. or I believe I believe it's Arizona in this case. Yeah, yeah maybe some pretty Utah. pretty close. Yeah, but I do like how they shoot these scenes because it is so vast and so empty, and I, I found these scenes to be kind of effective in, in just that. Again, not that it's fully convincing as an alien world. But I guess the isolation is convincing enough, if that makes sense. Although, I, I mean, I, I don't know if we can want to spoil the plot for who's ever listening, but it does yes, make yeah, sense. Yes, I know, yeah, I know where you're going with this. Yes. That, it, that it isn't actually an alien world. Well, first of all, I'm just going to say it. I think everyone knows this twist ending. This is sort of the, <laughs> this is sort of the sixth sense. Everybody knows the ending. It's on, the, it's on certain posters. It's on... It's on the DVD cover that I have yeah. that I watched. It's in The Simpsons. <laughs> the Simpsons did it, of course. But so everybody knows that this actually is Earth. I don't think we're really spoiling anything there. But this is really almost the same exact story. I mean, minus all the apes, of course, as the Twilight Zone episode, I Shot an Arrow into the Air. Rod Serling wrote it, although that was based on a short story, like how this was based on a novel. But in that one, a uh, space shuttle crash lands. They think they're on an alien planet because they've lost all contact with mission control. And then the surviving astronauts go, like, one of them goes crazy and he kills all the others. And then he finds that he's, like, 20 miles from Las Vegas, Nevada the entire time. (laughs) And this is pretty much the same ending. There's the same kind of story if you really expand that and add all the apes and stuff and, you know, change it and... But yeah, so it's, it's it's so there's a Rod Serling. I guess might have been fascinated with this kind of idea. I don't blame him because it's an awesome, it's a great twist. You know, it's it's like the, I mean, in the, in the great twist endings in film history, it's like this. It's the Sixth Sense. It's Fight Club, maybe. What what other ones? Mm, yeah. Ooh. Which no no one believes this, but I I called the Sixth Sense one when I first saw that. No, no one believes me when I say that. But I didn't watch it when it first came out. I was a little too young. And so it's possible that I heard there was a twist ending, and so I was, mm. like, looking for it. Yeah. But, you know, I don't remember. But I, I definitely had a feeling Bruce Willis I, was dead the entire movie. <laughs> yeah, I saw it in the theaters, actually. And what year did it come out? It was... 1999. Same year okay, as Fight yeah. Club. So I was, I was 14 when I saw it, which I think I was a little too young to fully... I, like, I got the movie, but I, I had no right. idea what was going to be coming at the end. So it was a definite twist for me. But okay. I can see that if you're... Especially now that we know more about M. Night Shyamalan, too. Just kind of like... Oh, with, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with Rod Serling, M. Night Shyamalan. They're both kind of known for their twists, so yes. when you're looking for one, I think they're yeah, easy that's to true. spot. And it's funny, though, you like Rod Serling, so many great classic twist endings in The Twilight Zone, and then obviously this. And then M. Night Shyamalan, one classic twist ending, he keeps trying to do, do more, and they just <laughs> don't work, but he keeps trying. God bless him. Everyone thought that, you know, the pretty much the flops he kept making after The Sixth Sense were the the things where he wasn't getting it quite right and then people finally realized that he just got really lucky the first time around yeah <laughs> yeah you you have a few filmmakers like that who like they just make one really good movie and then everything else they make is like kind of bad but you still kind of respect him because they they did a great job on that one movie yeah peter jackson maybe yeah but those are at least three movies <sighs> that's and, true I mean... they did film they filmed them all at the same time but yeah no same... that's true but but also like it, it, going back to early peter jackson they're not as good as the Lord of the Rings, but Heavenly Creatures is a fine movie. Brain Dead is an amazing movie, if you ask me. I even like Bad Taste. I haven't seen Meet the Feebles. That's his first movie. That was when, okay. back when he was a schlock auteur filmmaker in New Zealand, <laughs> you, obviously. You've, you've seen more of his oeuvre than I have. Yeah, I guess so. I have not seen The Lovely Bones. I haven't seen the recent Peter Jackson stuff. I haven't, mm. he, didn't he do the World War One documentary also? I didn't see that. Yes, and he did the, um, the 2005 King Kong. Which, that's okay but it's 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 about an hour too long if yeah you, if you trim think, the fat i think that's a very good movie yeah that was part of his problem was once he made the lord of the rings he mm-hmm. thought every movie he made had to be three hours at any rate i actually thought that planet of the apes uh, directed by franklin j schaffner i thought this might be that because i wasn't familiar with schaffner for anything else and it's like okay this is a classic movie what else did he do and it's like oh he did Patton. this isn't mm, even his most yeah. famous movie yeah. or most successful movie so i 
a uh, quality filmmaker from from in his day, I guess. So eventually, the three astronauts find their way to like a waterfall oasis, freshwater area, but they get all their clothes and supplies stolen by a group of mysterious natives. They track them down, and eventually they get their clothes back. Then they're observing these people, and they seem to be mute. And then they look. Uh, Charlton Heston has a line. He says they look more or less human because they are, you know, they're Mm -hmm. real actors. And we find out later that, of course, they are real humans. But then the hunt begins. And this scene is amazing. First of all, the score, Jerry Goldsmith. Jerry Goldsmith, of course, a classic composer. He's uh, this is arguably his best score, his most iconic score. I know he did Chinatown. I like his score for The Mummy, the Brendan Fraser Mummy. He did a good job on that. Mm, But this... This score is great. It's really weird. It's got, like, some tribal kind of stuff, like tribal drums, um, like primitive sounds, but it's also got this really great sci-fi sound to it. Kind of an unsettling piano, but this piece of music in this scene, it's just called The Hunt, is amazing. Look it up on YouTube. And then this, this scene is fantastic. This is when there's this loud noise and everyone starts running. So the astronauts starts, start running with them because they don't know what's going on. And it's revealed that they are being hunted by gorillas on horseback. Clothed gorillas, of course, who, who are also armed with guns. And we get you know, this is the this is the big reveal, right? Or you know you're watching Planet of the Apes, you know you're going to see people in ape costumes or ape makeup or whatever. It takes a while to get there, but we get it here. We get not really a, a great kind of reveal shot. They kind of like zoom in a little bit on the gorilla on horseback. Not not a great reveal. It's fine. But yeah, this is all the gorillas. And uh, we eventually see there's gorillas, there's chimpanzees, and there's orangutans. The one thing I really like about the movie is that they establish that without saying it they kind of establish that these are like different classes and they, they have like different personalities the chimpanzees are kind of the the peaceful people of of the society the orangutans are the ones in charge and the gorillas are like the militaristic soldiers cops prison mm-hmm. guards those types so, and i kind of like how that goes like if, if you're paying attention you'll be able to follow that but they don't ever like properly establish it through dialogue or anything no you need to be paying attention to see it i think it's kind of funny because uh, it actually helps popularize like a really total misconception of what the different apes are really like because chimpanzees are actually i think by far the most violent and aggressive of the three but this movie kind of instilled in the popular imagination that chimpanzees are like the intellectual well peaceful they are They are the most similar to humans, which is, I think, probably why they made that decision, because they're mm-hmm. in, they're the most, other than humans, they're the most intelligent mammals, right? But you're right, they are incredibly aggressive and violent, <laughs> and you do not want to mess with the chimpanzee. I mean, gorillas are, any, any of these animals, they're wild animals, any of them can be violent, but, you know, orangutans, I think, are, are just... <laughs> not not necessarily because of this movie, but orangutans suffer a giant misconception because if you go to a zoo and you see an orangutan, it's like the fattest animal on earth. Yeah. But then you see an orangutan in the wild and it's nothing like that. So right, I think there's right. just something yeah. about yeah. an orangutan's personality, its genetics, that if it's in captivity, it's just the laziest animal on earth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're probably depressed. <laughs> yeah, probably. Which 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 is sad because yeah. you know, all all orang all zoo orangutans look like Buddha. <laughs> and all orangutans in Borneo look like Gandhi. You know, they're yeah, skinny. They're yeah. in shape. <laughs> yeah, all in this movie, the orangutans are all pretty large boned. Yeah, they're a little heavier. Well. Yeah, but but they're not like, you know, they don't cast Jackie Gleason. Oh no, no, but <laughs> <laughs> they definitely portray them as stockier than like the chimpanzees. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So in this hunt scene, Dodge gets killed. Landon gets captured. And Taylor gets shot in the throat, although he survives. He's captured. And then we see the scene where the gorillas are kind of celebrating their victorious hunt. They're putting everybody in cages. They're taking photos with dead bodies, which is really kind of, like, a little disturbing. Like, we've seen stuff like that in history. And then what's the first word that the apes utter? Do you remember? Oh, I don't, actually. It is smile. Because he's taken the photo. That's oh, the, that's the yes. first thing. Well, yeah, any it's kind of the like say. a trophy hunt thing. Too. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. So then, 
back at the Ape City, which according to Wikipedia is what it's called. It's it's Ape City, which I, I don't believe is established in the movie, and I'm glad it isn't because it sounds stupid. <laughs> but a couple of veterinarian, chimpanzee veterinarians, save Taylor, but he's unable to speak even though he's trying to speak to them. And Zira, a chimpanzee, uh, I guess human psychologist, played by Kim Hunter from... Is that Marlon Brando movie? Oh, yeah, Streetcar Named Desire, the Tennessee Williams one, yeah. She takes an interest in Taylor because Taylor seems to be more sophisticated, more intelligent than all the other humans, of course, who are looked down upon by the apes as, well, well I'll say less than yeah. human. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're animals, right? They're, it's the way we would look at apes. And that's, that's the entire movie, really, is just... And it sounds silly... And believe me, this movie could be more silly than it is. I think it does a pretty good job at kind of riding that line of making a movie that you want to take seriously, but also kind of having some fun with it. Because there's the there's the ape makeup, which looks amazing, but it also it's ape makeup on people like it doesn't look perfect. Mm -hmm. And of course, now the recent Planet of the Apes movies, they do the CGI apes, which is probably the way to go as long as you have access to that technology in terms of making the apes feel truly ape because you never don't think that it's a human dressed up like an ape but that's yeah, also yeah. part there's of the only... charm of it that's you know it's there's a little little bit of a godzilla kind of like you know where part of the fun is that the, the it's people in costumes right yeah yeah they do they do play it pretty straight though for the most part and i have noticed and this is something i know you've seen at least one of the sequels because you oh i've seen them all but it's been okay. a, it's been quite a while for most right. of them well, I know you mentioned to me that Battle for the Planet of the Apes is a truly awful movie, and it is. That's the fifth <laughs> one. That's, yes. I remember as a kid hating Beneath the Planet of the Apes, which is the second one. That's just a weird movie. I'm not sure if I would still hate it if I were to watch it now. I'm a big fan of Escape from the Planet of the Apes. That's this movie, but in reverse. It's the apes visit modern-day Earth, and it's it's basically the Star Trek four of the Planet of the Apes series, where it's like yes. kind of a comedy. It's, yep. it's like a fish out of water kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth one is like one of the darkest movies ever. It's just amazing. It's it's a slave revolt of apes. It's just awesome. I really like that movie. But That one also explains why the world just ended up with only apes by saying that some sort of... Yeah, dogs and cats were all killed by some yes. extraterrestrial disease, so humans decided to turn apes into household pets. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I love that. That's a little hard to buy, but... It's a little hard to buy, but I, I love that. There's something about that fourth movie that's just awesome. Even, the, like, the look of the city. It's, it's I guess it's retro-futurism, but it's all this, like, fascist architecture-looking mm-hmm. stuff. Like, everything's concrete, and it just... That movie, like, puts me in a zone. Like, I, I, I don't know what it is about that movie. I really like that one. It's not as good as this one, obviously, but the reason I brought this up is Roddy McDowell, who we haven't met yet in this movie, he plays Cornelius, which is Zira's fiancé. Roddy McDowell was the star of the series. He's not the main character here. I don't think he has that big of a role in the second one, but he is the lead in the third, fourth, and fifth Planet of the Apes movies, playing a different character in the fourth and fifth. Because he plays the, spoilers, he plays the son of Cornelius in the fourth and fifth movies. I will say his performance, his ape performance, he's more committed than the other ape actors. I don't know what it is. You notice it with certain actors. Certain actors are just like, I'll single out the guy who plays Lucius, Mm -hmm. um, Zira's nephew or cousin or something. When he moves, he just kind of waddles around. Like, the actor has no idea what he's doing to (laughs) look like an ape. And it's fine. It's a small role, and it's kind of fun. But Roddy McDowell is committed to his his very specific hunch. He kind of twitches his nose a lot, which I Mm -hmm. think Kim Hunter Mm -hmm. does a bit too. But I think he has the most, I don't want to say believable or realistic ape performance, but he has the, I guess, the most convincing one, where it's, it's the least... Every single ape performance, you're aware it's a human in ape makeup, but he's, I guess, the most convincing, you know, for, for whatever that's worth. I, th- I think he does a good job. So I think it makes sense that they that he was the driving point of the series. And he's, I'm not going to say he's better than Andy Serkis in the new ones, but he is awesome in, like, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, the fourth one. Like, he's just, it's just kind of a similar performance to Andy Serkis, except not in motion capture, of course. And then, of course, in 2001... 
they rebooted oh, the remake, it. Yeah. yeah, which that one I also saw in the theaters. That one has a different kind of a twist ending, and one Charlton that Heston, doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. Charlton Charles, Heston cameo, which is yeah, fun. Yeah, he returns, but as an ape. Um, and the then, dying of course, ape. Uh, we have the three, uh, the new trilogy that came out in the, you know, twenty tens. Um, yeah. Oh, a pretty well regarded trilogy overall. I I wasn't wild about the first of those movies, the mm-hmm. James Franco one. Mm-hmm. I thought the second and third ones were great. I think at this point, I'm still going to say the original is my favorite Planet of the Apes movie. But I, you are not crazy if you pick like one of the new trilogy. I think you're kind of crazy if you pick w- one that isn't the original from the original series. But yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's not it's not crazy to say War for the Planet of the Apes is the best apes movie. I don't think. No, no. I, there's there's quite a few of the later ones which are are good. I think yeah, you're right. I, I kind of agree with you that maybe like the second one is, you know, the Beneath the Planet of the Apes might be one of the worst. And I think part of the reason for that is because Charlton Heston comes back in it, but in a small role. Yes. And he he ends up. I don't remember if it's accidentally or not. He ends up destroying the planet by setting okay. off. Okay. The... I actually want to say <laughs> that about the second one. So well, on this podcast. We'll cover the series in order. In theory, we'll eventually get to the second one. Who knows? The second one has the most bleak ending in the history of motion pictures. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even more bleak than this one. And I kind of love it. It's really the only that Like, I didn't, don't like that movie, but the last ten minutes of it are amazing. <laughs> the entire Earth is yeah. destroyed. All right. It's so great. I won't go into any more details about it then, since you'll get to it in some future yeah. episode. But yeah. Right after Linda Harrison, who plays Nova gets her first word of the series a full two movies in she finally gets to say something and then immediately the entire world is destroyed yeah (laughs) poor linda so yeah so linda harrison she's a model of some sort i would kind of expect this to be her first acting role because she doesn't really act yeah but she is having also yeah yeah she is also in captivity she is a very beautiful woman of course she's wearing that kind of the loincloth bikini sort of thing the raquel welch kind of clothing taylor is very interested in her even though obviously she can't communicate with him so we also meet dr zayas who is the orangutan we find out later he's the what's his job title exactly he's, he's like the head of the ministry of science and as well as like the head of the ministry of religion or something like yeah that. it's some sort of like religious orthodoxy office i would say yeah yeah, he's yeah. A, he's a zealot is his thing, and yeah, he's yeah. he disapproves of Zira, um, Zira and and her observations. Zira wants to study the creatures. You know, she finds them interesting. She, you know, she doesn't view them as equals, but she doesn't think they should be executed or anything like that. Meanwhile, Zayas is like, yeah, we should do experimental brain surgery on all of them, basically mm-hmm. lobotomizing them all. And we also, of course, meet Cornelius, Zira's fiance, who believes that. He has a controversial theory that apes evolved from a lower form of mammal, potentially humans. And he he doesn't go into it too much because the ideas are her- heretical. And at first, when Zero mentions them, he's downplaying them like he no longer believes in them. But it's also clear that, like, it's Dr. Zayas put the kibosh on these kinds of ideas and... Mm-hmm find out later that he had gone he's an archaeologist he had gone into the forbidden zone which is the desert area where taylor originally crash landed and that he had found some artifacts and stuff that kind of led him to believe this but that zayas stopped him from digging any further i think it's also implied i don't remember if it's in this movie or one of the later ones because zayas reappears too i think it might be in the sequel um yeah i think just about it's, everyone in the first one's in the second yeah one, I, think. I believe Even it's, if it's kind like of charlton aston is much yeah it's role. implied at some point that dr zayas actually knows the truth yeah and, and the first real glimpse of the idea that zayas knows the truth is when taylor is trying to write something in the dirt when he's outside oh yes yes a couple of the other humans including nova she wipes it away and then there's a fight that breaks out and taylor is captured and taken back inside and then when everything is wrapping up dr zayas looks down at the ground and sees very clearly letters written in english and he just wipes them away Mm -hmm. eventually taylor is able to prove that he can write which gets zira and cornelius interest interested in him they take him to their house and he tries to explain 
things about, uh, you know, explain how he got here, that he crash landed, he's from another planet. They don't even believe in flight. They think it's a scientific impossibility. And then he demonstrates it by making a paper airplane, which is awesome. Yeah, that was always one of my favorite scenes of this well, movie. Well, I, I love how fascinated Roddy McDowell is with the airplane when he picks yes, it up. That's yes. a really good performance. But It is. I'm thinking if I were in Taylor's position, I've never been able to make a paper airplane. I've tried. I've, I've tried. <laughs> I've tried. I mean, I haven't <laughs> tried in a long time. If I were in Taylor's position, I'd try to make a paper airplane to prove that flight is possible. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I, I I know people that can make really good ones. I could always make a one that barely would get anywhere. But yeah, <laughs> he, yeah. he does he does make a good airplane very quickly, mm-hmm. and it proves his point immediately. I also they they ask him when, where he learned to write, and he says uh, Jefferson School, Fort Wayne, Indiana, which I like <laughs> that. That that actually comes back later because Doctor Zayas confronts him and he says like I don't believe anything you've said, but there's still some truth in what you said because you said you learned it from Fort Wayne and he's like even even in, <laughs> you you've let it slip that that you came from a military background or something and it's like that's mm, yeah. that's funny if if you if you don't know anything about America and you just hear a town like Fort Worth or Fort Wayne yeah i i can understand that it's true there's a very similar uh, this is totally off topic um there's a very similar scene in the original red dawn movie where the soviets are basically implying that anybody that's in the boy scouts is in a paramilitary organization because they <laughs> have ranks they wear uniforms yeah they you know learn survival okay. skills things like that yeah. yeah that's i could i could kind of believe it yeah a planet where man is the lowest order of living things and the superior beings are Apes. Eventually, and this is this is after Dr. Zayas takes note of the paper airplane, he's suspecting something's up, obviously, with Taylor. Mm-hmm. So he orders that he's going to be lobotomized. But Taylor, of course, who still can't speak, overhears this. And so he escapes when they're about to, when the guerrilla guard is about to collar and leash him and take him in. Mm-hmm. So he escapes, and there's a very exciting scene where he's running all throughout Ape City. There's a lot of... I hate the term. I hate the term, world building. But I'm going to use it here, like where he goes, he stumbles upon the gorilla funeral and stuff like that. And I, I like this stuff. Mm-hmm. I love the set design, very 1960s future kind of thing. But also, obviously, like little Flintstones. Yeah, too, I was going to say it. It's always yeah. had a Flintstones look to me. Yeah, I think that's fair. And he eventually hides in a museum where he's able to blend in with all these stuffed humans. And then that's actually where he finds his fallen comrade, not Landon, who's the other one, the one who didn't really Dodge. have a character. Dodge, yeah. Yeah, he finds him there, which is a effective moment. He's eventually captured outside. He's put in a giant net and is lifted overhead. And this is when he finally says his first words in like an hour. And he says, take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. Yes, which has what a become moment. an iconic line. Yeah. It's an iconic line, and it's it's such a great moment, too. You see all the the chimpanzees, the gorillas, who have all gathered to either take them down or to watch what's going on. Their reactions to this is, is really great. I mean, yeah, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful moment. And, you know, for the rest of the movie, basically, Charlton Heston doesn't stop talking. This is when he's back in the cage. They can't just execute him now because... You know, the entire city has, has seen that there's a speaking Yeah, human, it's too I guess. late. The genie's out of the bottle. Exactly. But this is when he names Nova, and he's eventually put on trial, and we find that he hasn't seen Cornelius or Zira in a few weeks, but he's at this, like, tribunal. It's run by the three orangutans. I think there's four orangutans. There's three at the main table, then there's also, like, the prosecutor, who mm, is also yes, an orangutan. Yeah. And they're, the whole thing is they're, they're they're trying to find the truth about him, where he comes from, they in- insist that he's not on trial because he's not an ape. He does not have rights. And when Taylor tries to defend himself, he's informed that he can't. He's not allowed to speak, so he tries to deliver a prepared statement through Cornelius. And overall, this, this is a really great scene. There's a fun little moment where he's saying something, or maybe it's Cornelius is saying something, and then the three orangutans at the table, like the three judges, I guess, Z- Dr. Zayas being one of them, they do the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil thing mm-hmm. with their hands. Because they basically don't believe that he's from another planet. They they don't think that's possible. But, but, they're, but they're right. <laughs> well, well that, that's ultimately true. But, they, but the reason they don't think he's from another planet is because they don't believe in, 
in flight or space travel right, or anything right, like right. that. Yeah. And so they say, like, oh, you said you came with other people. Can you find another person to co- corroborate your story? And he eventually finds Landon. They take him out to the kind of like an amphitheater area of mm-hmm. the public square. And he finds Landon, but Landon cannot speak because he has been lobotomized by Dr. Zayas. Yeah. And he's got and, a gruesome scar on his forehead yes. to, to prove the point. <laughs> so if all things go south. Eventually at the trial, Cornelius and Zira end up expressing very heretical beliefs. So they're going to be charged with heresy. And the beliefs, of course, are that apes evolve from men. And then after the after the trial's all, all done, Dr. Zayas meets with Taylor personally. And I really like this scene. You know, Taylor is in a humiliating position he's shirtless he's got his arms bound behind his back it looks like really painful and uncomfortable and dr zayas is talking to him and he's like listen the the whole the trial was it was predetermined you were going to lose the whole point of this was we could finally get zira and cornelius we could expose them and it's like okay dr zayas has been one step ahead of everybody he's he's very smart he's very yes, just he's very he's, savvy he's in an yeah evil he's savvy way. he's awful he's a really awesome villain i think he's a really <laughs> underrated villain no nobody ever talks about dr zayas when they talk about great movie villains and i think some people should I, I think he is awesome and he even admits he's like listen i don't buy anything that you said but i do th- but but you are dangerous and i do think there are more of you and he basically admits that he lobotomized landon and, and he's like there's more of you there's another tribe we need to know where you're from then you can spare yourself but taylor obviously he's like i'm not protecting anyone i just like everybody who's part of my tribe is died you know died 1700 years ago or whatever you know like there's nothing <laughs> yeah so eventually dr zira and cornelius execute an escape plan with the help of zira's nephew um what's his name not julius julius is the guard lucius Lucius, yes. They all have, like, Roman names. They yeah, all have, they like, do. Latin names. <laughs> is Zayas? Well, Z- no, but it ends in a U.S. Yeah, yeah, so no, I was it's... actually wondering about it. I was wondering if it was something they just made up or if it actually had some... Well, and Zira, I guess. I don't know. But it ends in an A, and it's a feminine name, so that could yeah, be a yeah. Latin noun in yeah. theory. And then eventually we get Caesar, of course, later oh, in the yes, series. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Man has no understanding. He can be taught a few simple tricks, nothing more. You did it. You cut up his brain, you funny baboon! Lucius helps Taylor escape. Lucius is... I want to talk about this character, because I think he's kind of annoying, but there's something kind of likable about him, too. And part of it is just, like, how kind of dated it is, because, like, I mentioned the ape performance isn't great. He kind of, like, walks with, like, a waddle. It's like, I don't really know what he's doing as an actor. But his thing is that I guess he's a teenager. He talks like he's younger. He complains about the older generations all the time. Mm -hmm. I think this is like a 1960s, like, hippie thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Because they also, there's a... There's that famous line about, you know, if he wears a beard or not, and he says, oh, no, yes. I don't go in for fads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which this I guess, is... Is, you know, it's a joke because the apes all have what looks right. to be a beard. So then it makes you wonder, what is what is an idea of an ape's beard? Yeah. But, yeah. But also, you know, kind of, you always connect beards and facial hairs with hippies and stuff, particularly yeah, in the I 60s. Guess so. but... Yeah, I guess so. It's funny, you say, you say that's a famous line, and I, I think... I think... <laughs> I don't think Lucius okay. is a single famous it's a, line. It's a line. It's a line I remember. Yes. Well, no, but that's the thing is that Lucius has several lines that I remember. I, I like. You can't trust the older generation. Like yeah. he has like lines yeah. like that that yep. are just kind of stupid. But I, I just always remember them for whatever reason. I think I liked the character a lot as a kid. Don't really like him now, but I still kind of like him just because you know I. It's stupid, but so. They meet up with Zira and Cornelius away from the city. They've got guns, and they eventually head out to the Forbidden Zone. They find the old dig site. But when they find that, Dr. Zayas and his gorillas have arrived. There's a little bit of a standoff, a little, you know, shootout, but it ends quickly because Taylor threatens Dr. Zayas. And they take him inside of the cave, and they discuss what Cornelius's finds were. And at first, his finds aren't that impressive. He's like, I, I found some of these like tools and stuff, and the fact that we don't know what they're from 
or what they are seems to imply that the older generations were more advanced than us and it's like that's not the most convincing thing if that if that's all if that's all you have it's right but 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 he also didn't know what they were and then taylor did know what the things were he's like these are eyeglasses this is like an artificial heart valve and this is like fake teeth and it's like okay the ultimate kicker and i love this moment um nova discovers it accidentally because there's a human doll and nova is touching it examining it and then it speaks it says mama then they're like okay dr zayas explain this when would an ape make a talking doll a talking human doll because at first dr zayas is like well yeah you know we used to keep you know way back when we used to keep humans in homes as pets right Mm -hmm, mm because and then we discovered that they were too violent but then it's like okay no these weren't just household apes these these weren't just household humans these were humans that lived on their own right then Lucius is overtaken by the gorillas, and he gets off a couple of warning shots. So there's a another slight shootout. Taylor kills a gorilla, and then pretends that he's shot, which draws Dr. Zayas out of the cave. And then he ta- takes Dr. Zayas hostage. He exchanges him for a horse, some ammo, and some food and water so that he and Nova can take off. He's going to look for answers for the truth. And Dr. Zayas, of course, says, you don't look for it. You might not like what you find. And at this point, it's clear that Dr. Zayas knows everything. Yeah. You know, he, he knows he that. Knows, he knows far more than the audience knows. He knows more than Cornelius and Taylor and a- absolutely. Zira. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Taylor rightfully points out, like, oh, he's the minister of science, then also, like, the minister of religion. And is like, okay, what's, what's the... There's a contradiction here. But then he's like, no, there is no contradiction. He cites... The holy ape scripture, which I like that they keep referring to the the old lawgiver and the mm-hmm. the sacred scrolls and all that stuff. He has he has Cornelius read a passage and it, and it's basically the passage says that humans are are violent. Beware of man. He is the only beast that kills for sport and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And he's like, this is this is why we needed to keep the truth from everybody. It's because like this. All that other stuff might be true, but this is also true. Like mm-hmm. that, that humans are just savages. And it's like, okay, that's really interesting. And again, that makes Zeus such a more compelling villain because he's not hes not just evil. He is motivated by something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you can obviously draw parallels to anything in politics today. On the surface, there's a lot of racial stuff with Planet of the Apes, obviously. And that's probably what audiences most grasped onto when this came out in 1968 the kind of the height of the civil rights movement Mm -hmm. but there's also so much stuff about like separation of church and state and a a little bit like galileo and these like ideas that threaten the church and stuff like that like there's there's historical parallels there's modern day parallels some really really interesting stuff yeah i mean there's still a lot of stuff in it that's even relevant today and it's yes you know what is it now 54 years later in America, there's still people that believe the Earth is like 3,000 years old. Mm-hmm. And, and that would flat. be one thing if just some people <laughs> believed that. That would just be one thing. But then those people are also having influence or outright writing laws. Mm-hmm. Like, that's mm-hmm. a little something else, you know. Um, <laughs> at any rate, Taylor takes off. He um, He's initially chased by the gorillas, but Dr. Zayas lets him go. He and Nova stumble upon, of course, the Statue of Liberty, which is half buried in the sand on the beach. Iconic image. And this, of course, makes Taylor realize that he's been on Earth the entire time and that there was some kind of nuclear holocaust or some sort that is what brought about the end of the human race superiority, I, I suppose. Not the end of the human race as we know it. Well, you could but, say the, the end of human civilization. I guess. Yeah, civilization is yeah, a good yeah, word. Yes, yeah. and that we end with the end. We also just we end with another iconic line with the mm-hmm. "You finally did it. You blew it up. Damn you! Damn you all to hell!" And then the movie ends. So yeah, another very dark ending. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, and, but again, as I said, this ending incredibly dark. Somehow the second one even more <laughs> dark. Yes. Somehow, like it's hard to believe, but they pulled it off. I think. But Sean, what did you think of the original? planet of the apes i have seen this movie many times and 
I still enjoy it. I mean, parts of it I think are getting a little bit dated, but it still remains surprisingly relevant for, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, a 54-year-old sci-fi film. But this one still makes a lot of very poignant, kind of incisive points, I think, that are almost as relevant today as they were when the movie was made. And I think the acting's great, the makeup's good for, you know, what it was. Charlton Heston, I kind of have a... I wouldn't say it's a love-hate relationship with him, maybe a like-dislike relationship. Sometimes... How much of this is him as a as a human, though? Because oh, that's, as a I, person? I, I... No, it's it's not... Even if I remove him and his okay. politics from it... Because I don't have defenses for some of the stuff he did with the no, IRA and stuff. I, his, his acting sometimes is very kind of stilted or melodramatic when it doesn't need to be. Okay. I think I mentioned to you um, when we were talking you know, before the episode that I rewatched Soylent Green uh, a couple months ago because it's set in 2022. And one right, of the things which we like haven't, do... we, I haven't recorded that yet, so I haven't watched it recently, but that was our previous week's episode. Okay. So <laughs> when this episode comes out, I will have seen that movie quite <laughs> recently, but. It's also good. I like it, but, but Charlton Heston tends to do a lot of kind of over the top yelling it's a mad yeah, house, that stuff. Yeah, over the top, you know, throwing his arms around, gesticulating. Sometimes it's just a little bit too much. So I think sometimes he just goes overboard with it. Kind of like um, Nicolas Cage kind of has a reputation Ooh. for nowadays. Charlton Heston, I just think sometimes he was he's... the pre-Nicolas yeah, Cage. he's like yeah, too melodramatic, that, too over the okay. top. Well, I, I do think, speaking of Charlton Heston, we kind of mentioned the epic films that kind of where he made his name. I do remember thinking, what, eventually watching Ben Hur, because mm -hmm. that was a movie. That movie won a ton of Oscars. He won the Best Actor Oscar for that, and a lot of like older movies, you can see them, and it's like, okay, this was considered a great performance for the time. It's really not a great performance now. Some of them really do hold up. Yeah, yeah. I thought Heston's performance in Ben Hur really didn't hold up. I didn't think that was great by today's standards. I did think, though, eventually seeing the Ten Commandments, I thought he was great in that. Okay. So I don't think it's like a thing I have with Heston specifically, because I have seen Heston be very good. And I do think Planet of the Apes, I don't think it's like a world-class performance, but I think he's good. I think mm -hmm. he's... Um, mm -hmm. My least favorite scenes with him are early on, the stuff we kind of skipped over. I mentioned it briefly, but when he's kind of talking to Landon, they're journeying through the desert. He's just like weirdly... Like, I mentioned cynical, but he's, like, weirdly, he's, like, rubbing it in Landon's face that, like, all his friends are dead. I think it's less the performance and more just, like, how those scenes are written. I just don't yeah, really know yeah. what he's, why they wrote the scenes that way. But I don't think Heston's performance, you know, maybe a better performance could have made those scenes work better. Yeah. When he's not speaking, I think he's great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, I believe all the struggles that he's going through. When he's, any anything involving him being, like, tortured or, or anything, like... I believe he's in real pain, like, when he's got his arms held behind his back, when he's talking to Dr. Zayas, and he's, like, clearly uncomfortable, which that's probably not acting, the, the way they have his arms tied up. Yeah, it actually looks uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, he's got some iconic line deliveries, like, he say does. what you will about the overall yeah. performance, but he makes he makes some moments iconic that maybe other actors might not have done Wouldn't as good a job at. So, yeah, that's true. Overall, I would say I think he's pretty good. I mentioned Roddy McDowell, probably my favorite performance in the movie, just because of all the ape stuff that he does. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> again, the human in ape makeup ape stuff. <laughs> I think he just does a better job than all the other actors for that. And that's even more clear in the, in the sequels, I think. And I, w I will say, like you mentioned, part of it's dated, but you know, the, 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 the message or the key message or messages kind of remain true or remain relevant. And so I will say, I, I agree with you. I think aspects of the movie, details of the movie have dated, but overall the story has not dated. And I think that's what makes this yeah, movie and, and like, great. Yeah, and like its warnings are very uh, prescient still today. Right. And I think just overall, I think it's a, just a really good storytelling Mm -hmm. like how the story unfolds character writing can be a bit better but the the how long it takes us to actually get to the apes and then that that sort of middle section where taylor can't talk and the story moves in a very particular direction when he can't talk and then how everything changes once he can talk i, I just think the way the story unfolds is really really well done and then obviously it hits it all home with a fantastic twist ending. Mm -hmm. I think something just really, really worked about the movie. I have some complaints, and again, this goes back to the kind of the dated or the aged things. 
I think some of the filmmaking is downright weird. The, you notice the way they, like, zoom in on stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we can bl- blame the director, maybe, for yeah, that. Yeah, I guess it's yeah. the director, the cinematographer, maybe both. But, like, I remember even as a kid thinking that was weird. Like, there there are moments, like, I'll just single one out where Landon is putting a little tiny American flag in the dirt after they make landfall. And this is when Charlton Heston laughs at him like an asshole. But <laughs> he's putting the flag in. And then they do this like slow zoom in on the flag, like so to make sure that we see it better. And and you picture this being done in a modern movie. And if it's like an Edgar Wright or a Tarantino, the zoom would be like super quick. But then it doesn't even have to be like a super stylized director like those right. two. Right, and it would also be kind of tongue in cheek if they did it in a movie yes. like that. Yes, yes, the Tarantino especially. But like, yeah. most people now, if they were doing something like that, they would just show a different angle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, there would there would be a cut there, and the flag is it's one of several things that happens that happens numerous times throughout the movie where they do that slow zoom, and it just feels so weird. And I haven't seen a lot of movies even from that time period that did that, and I guess I just don't like it. You know, that's that's a kind of a really specific thing, but it does bother me because it happens a number of times in the movie, probably yeah, seven it's, or it's eight. It's almost distracting. Yeah. Yes, I think so. I think it yeah. is. And again, yeah. as a kid, that bothered me. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But overall, great movie, great storytelling, great yeah. makeup for it's a classic, the time. Classic for good reason. I would and say. an excellent score too. I don't think we said enough about how great the Jerry Goldsmith score is. Even though there's some weird music kind of early, the scene where they're kind of stumbling down the mountain mm-hmm. is some of the weirdest music I've ever heard in a film. And I'm just going to blame the late <laughs> '60s for that. Yeah, yeah. But the rest of the score is fantastic. Well, Jerry Goldsmith is actually known for doing. I mean, he's known, you know, for all his classical stuff, but he's also known for being very rather avant-garde from time to time. I know his. He did the score for Alien as well, which is considered, yeah. you know, quite kind of groundbreaking in terms of its use of. Um, is it? Yeah, because it uses a lot of, like, non-instruments for sounds okay. and a lot of, you know, electronic pieces. Okay, um, I guess that score just has never stood out to me. I'm, I'm just not the biggest Alien fan, though, too. I think, I think it's more the fact that how unusual and new it is. Like, it tried a lot of experimental right. things. Kind of like, you've probably seen Forbidden Planet, right? Yeah, also, yeah, Forbidden Planet does a lot of that, too, with, like, a yeah. theremin and... It's a genuinely not very good score. It's not fun to listen to. But it was super influential because it was just using a bunch of instruments that no one had ever used before, Yeah, basically. yeah, exactly, yeah. So yeah, good movie. In a small Wisconsin town, something was about to happen that would send shockwaves around the world. So for our second film today, we're going to be talking about 1975's The Giant Spider Invasion, directed by Bill Rebane, starring, among others, Alan Hale Jr., most famous probably for playing the skipper. Probably. Uh, (laughs) Probably, (laughs) like he's done anything else of note. (laughs) A.K.A. Jonas Grumby, uh, the, the skipper's actual name. Oh, that's the real yeah, character's yeah. name? Okay. That's a good uh, party. Yeah, a good trivia, yeah, trivia yeah. fact. Get on the emergency unit. I'm down here all by myself. They're hell-bent on destroying that beast. Um, Barbara Hale from... Not related. Barbara Hale from Perry Mason, I believe, probably okay. she's most famous from. She was Perry Mason's assistant. And Steve Brody, who actually, surprisingly, was... Oh, wait, no, he's not the one I'm thinking of. Did he ever play Walt Disney? Did Steve, I don't know, he, he should if he hasn't. Well, I'll tell you what, I think he looks like Disney more specifically and more accurately. He looks like in National Lampoon's Vacation, whatever the character's name is, who Wally World is named after, they're very clearly doing like a Disney-type thing. He looks like that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. He definitely. looks more like that guy than he looks like Disney, I guess. Yeah, but he, he, he looks does. a little like Disney. No, no, he he does, he does. There's definitely no arguing with that and robert easton yes so robert easton the guy who plays the uh main character for a while until he's killed who's actually known as the man of a thousand voices and there's a whole big wikipedia is this the girdle farmer yeah yeah the girdle guy dan kester is the character's name although everybody just kind of knows him as the girdle wearing kind of gross wisconsin yeah one of the most disgusting characters to ever appear in film really 
Yeah, he's apparently, the actor himself is known for being able to do pretty much any type of accent, and he was in many, many movies and TV shows over the years. Clearly in the twilight of his career at this point, I guess we could say. <laughs> It's true of Alan Hale. It's true. <laughs> That's of, true. Um, yes. Steve Brody was was like he's not a nobody, but at this point in his career, mid seventies, I'm sure he's more or less a nobody. You know. Yeah, Barbara Hale also. You know, this was yeah. After Perry, Mason Perry Mason was Mason. twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They came from another world to destroy the Earth. It was the giant spider invasion. So giant spider invasion. Now, uh, as Patrick mentioned at the opening of the episode, I would guess most people probably know Giant Spider Invasion from its 1997 Mystery Science Theater 3000 lampooning, but the movie itself actually is also available in its original cut. Uh, it on came Tubi. Out as a, yeah, it's on Tubi. They came out with a remastered Blu-ray of it a few years ago, which has the original you know, negatives that they did a whole new transfer on, so it's basically in HD now, which is pretty amazing for a, a B-movie from 1975. And it's, I love, like, they're, they're putting anything in Blu-ray nowadays. It's, it's amazing. Yes. Like, it's just, if it's got any kind of, like, B-movie cult niche audience, there's going to be a Blu-ray for it. If there's not one now, wait a few years. Yeah, know? but I really enjoy, actually, when they find the original negatives, the original film, and can do, like, a modern you know present day hd transfer of it because if they do it right it's amazing to see a movie that's you know 40 some years old that looks like it's brand new mm -hmm. i always had this idea that the 70s were were brown and kind of sepia tone because that's oh, what yeah. most of the movies of the 70s looked like well the, the b movies of the 70s yeah yeah look awful and yeah, that's part of and, the charm, honestly. Yeah, but I think when I was younger, I always just kind of thought that that's what living through the seventies looked sure. like. So it's, it's it's like in um in like Breaking Bad or something. If there's a scene set in Mexico, they just put a brown yellow filter yeah yeah filter over, on over it yeah camera. yeah yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. So anyway, yeah, I have the HD Blu-ray of it, which I I watched a couple times. <laughs> and it has it has some extra scenes in it. Well, I guess they're not extra scenes. They're, they're extra not scenes in the Mystery Science if you Theater. Didn't, uh, yeah, if yeah. you're familiar with the Mystery Science Theater version, they're extra. But they were in the original. Including some of the most awkward nudity I've seen <laughs> yes. on film before. It's, yeah. it's up there. Yeah, it's almost like a tentacle porn kind of thing with the spider arm coming into the oh see i wasn't even th i was thinking about the 15 year old character <laughs> who gets oh, out yeah. of the shower when uh, charles manson is talking to her that that, that oh scene. oh yeah well there's also the scene where the house is getting torn down by the spider yeah. and i guess she's not naked but she's very scantily clad running yeah. around the house as it's being torn down by the the spider and is arm. that the wife or is that the extramarital affair girlfriend the relationships in this film are rather confusing yes well, there's the husband who's the who's the the, the girdle farmer. Yes, um, and then he has his wife, and then they have his wife's younger sister, I believe, that lives with them, and who she's he's also into. She's the one that's in the house when it gets torn down. So what is his wife's oh, younger yeah. so sister? Oh yeah, so that's would it's the same. His... It's the same woman in, with the sh she's the nude scene with when she gets out of the shower. Too, oh right? okay, because okay, her, yes, so, but okay. then that's also she's different than the one he's having the extramarital affair with. Yes, that's yes, Helga. that's true. But he's still <laughs> into her though. Yeah, and well, he could very well have an extramarital affair. Oh yes, he could. He could. at some point with this underage child. I, yes, I, I, she looks thirty, but they imply that she's. I don't yeah. think they say an exact age. She does. She. I think he says something like, "I should have married you and not your sister, yes, yes, or, sister yeah, or something." Yeah, and she's like, "But I was 15. Which, and, <laughs> and she's like, "Now I'm thirty five, twenty four, <laughs> thirty six, or something." It's like, oh, yeah. that's kind of a funny line i guess it's a little yeah it's, it's kind of creepy up. also what yeah. is your what is your wife's younger sister um or not stepsister sister no sister-in-law sister yeah so it's, she's his younger sister-in-law so there's a whole extra level of well it didn't you know, stop the kennedys though <laughs> that's true there has never been a film like this before it is as the name implies Somewhat. Yeah, I because guess. there's there's regular sized spiders too. So we're in a small Wisconsin town, Merrill, Wisconsin. I don't know if that's a real town or a made up town. Well eventually they Do go you? to Gleason, and Gleason is definitely a real town. Merrill okay. um 
my internet just went out, so I can't see if Merrill's real, but I'm assuming it's real. Yes, it is. Okay, there we go. Okay, Lincoln okay. County. So it's the same county as uh, Gleason. So yeah, we start in this small rural Wisconsin town, and we've got Dan Kester, who is the guy played by Robert Easton, the man of a thousand voices, who is this, <laughs> I, I guess, hill folk is kind of the best word for him. He's he's a very rough... Sleazeball. Sleazeball, girdle-wearing, unkempt... Long underwear. I, I think he's supposed to be a farmer, but it doesn't actually seem like he does any farming. It's more... Well, I guess he's a rancher. He's a cattle farmer because eventually yeah. when they find the dead cows on his property, his wife is like, oh, no, this is like, we're out all this money. And he's like, no, we're not. We can just sell this to the diner and we just won't tell him about it. And it's yeah, like, Jesus. Yeah. So he's, <laughs> you know, he's a sl- total sleaze too. Yeah. We have the scene at the beginning where we just talk about where he is, he and his wife are having some clear marital problems and then he's hitting on his sister-in-law who is very young and also in some ways reciprocating the oh yeah she's into it yeah yeah she's into it which you know i think she can do better anybody in the town would probably be a better option so we then get what appears to be some mat work explosions going on in the background which turns out to be a meteor crash somewhere on their wisconsin cattle farm and like i said the special first effects are all matte work this movie had a a budget of three hundred thousand dollars which even in 1975 i guess for a b movie it's not a terrible budget in 1975 it also seems like it would be less yeah that's true they 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 waste they blew all their money on getting alan hale probably (laughs) probably yeah i think there's some talk of whether you know it was some sort of nuclear blast or anything like that but clearly it wasn't we all know the soviet's when they were planning their nuclear strategy, they were targeting Rhinelander, Wisconsin. That was their number <laughs> yes. one target. Yes, But again, that, we kind of get some similarities then, too, with uh, Planet of the Apes here. We have this kind of fear of nuclear war being worked into these... A little Cold War stuff. A little yeah, Cold, war, Cold war stuff in the you know 60s and 70s. We're only seven years later from Planet of the Apes. Just and it seems 15 years earlier, based on the quality <laughs> of the film. But it does, maybe you, yeah. Maybe you don't think that with watching the Blu-ray, but I just watched it on Tubi. So then, yeah, then the next day, Dan goes out to try and find out where the explosion came from, and he stumbles upon kind of a, a little crater, and then he finds some geodes in it, or what are actually geodes that they're using as props. But the geodes end up turning out to be some sort of spider egg or spider... Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's not really implied if the spiders are intelligent or not, if this is some sort of spaceship, or if, you know, they just... Well, they, they drive a car... The main spider drives a Volkswagen Beetle. I think they're pretty intelligent. I just thought they were using that as oh, the set to move. Oh, oh yeah. okay. <laughs> no, I was, oh, well. I was kidding. <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah, so it's not clear if the spiders are just like this natural alien force that right. accidentally crashed or if, you know, they came on a ship and we just can't tell it's a ship because their yeah. technology is so different. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the spiders end up hatching from these geodes, kind of overrunning the farmhouse. Dan's wife... Ev or Eve? Ev. There's some kind of gross out humor scenes in it where like she ends up blending one of the spiders into her <laughs> morning smoothie or whatever it is she's drinking. She kills some of them that are around the house. You know, I'd be a little more concerned than she is. You know, she says something along the lines of like this there's so many spiders in this house, but they're like these tarantulas that are just wandering yeah, around the Wisconsin farmhouse. Well, so. I would th- I think the reason she's not as concerned is I think she's drunk the entire oh, time. Oh yeah, that's right? true. That's true. Like yeah, you say a lot of morning smoothie. Abuse. I think that's her morning margarita. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I'm cleaning it up for the <laughs> the audience. So yeah, both casters are very clearly, you know pretty much wasted the entire film dan is constantly drinking ev is constantly drinking probably because she's married to dan yeah and it's a pretty bleak life out there on their wisconsin cattle farm yeah yeah so there's spiders everywhere she blends one into her morning margarita or morning (laughs) smoothie whatever you want to believe it is uh so yeah there's some gross out humor and then we kind of cut to our other main plot so other than the kesters we kind of have our nasa scientists plot going on and there's these two plots that are kind of running simultaneously throughout they never the film. really intersect they end up dealing with the same issue obviously they end up both 
dealing with the spider issue, but Dan never meets up with these people. They're, they're, their stories never truly intersect. It's kind of weird. No, the only thing that kind of ties everything together, I think, is actually Alan Hale's character. <laughs> <laughs> and and, the, and what's worth noting about the Alan Hale stuff is like if he is the glue that holds these two <laughs> plots together, it seems like Alan Hale has no idea what movie he's in. Oh no, time. no! And I'm pretty sure that's even a joke they make in the Mystery Probably. Science Theater. Well, version. every line he has, he's supposed to be the sheriff, and he's this like jovial figure. Like I get it, you have that character. But he's every line he says is like a terrible joke. Like every line, he's like at no point yes. is he like concerned. <laughs> no, no. Like I love the scene when he meets with the the NASA scientist at, at like the restaurant or whatever, and he he confuses NASA with Nassau. And oh yeah, just like yes. every and again every he has like three lines that scene. They're all like jokes. They're all just like terrible jokes. It's just really weird, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> do a little bit of a trivia here. So Alan Hale, this is clearly well after Gilligan's Island at this right. point. He's past his prime in a lot of ways. He he looks he looks old. Yeah. Do you want to guess how old he actually is in this role? I'm assuming because you're asking this, he's probably younger than he looks. <laughs> so I'll guess like sixty. Oh, he's 54. Jesus! <laughs> he looks like 75, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, you say past his prime, and it's obviously true, but my understanding of Gilligan, the show, because that, that was, the show ran in the 60s, mm-hmm. my understanding of that is it wasn't actually that successful when it was on, and it's a show that kind of became big in syndication, in reruns. Yeah, That's how yeah. my dad has talked about it. I think Br- the Brady Bunch was a little bit like that. Brady Bunch was probably bigger when it was on, though. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, like... Gilligan was probably never more popular than it was in the mid seventies. Oh, but, probably yeah, that's true. But it actually, still couldn't yeah. get him a better role than this no, movie no. shot in rural Wisconsin. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah, actually, personally, even in the you know mid nineties when I was in grade school, if I ever had a sick day from school, mm-hmm. Gilligan's Island was what I watched because it tended to still be on. Because it was always know, on. Yeah, thirty, it's, it's 30 like, years later, in the middle of the day, a bunch of channels played Gilligan's Island. Yeah, I don't so. think we have this today in in the show that wasn't that big when it was on that is just always on and reruns i think a lot of old shows have that i think gilligan brady bunch adam's family are like the Mm -hmm, big three mm -hmm. yeah and then but it's like the shows that are always on now i used to joke i think this is less true now but at any given moment you could find law and order on tv but law and order was a was a big show or is a big show and svu is a very big show and that's and then, and it's like Seinfeld's always on, but Seinfeld was huge. Like so, yeah. Same with Frasier, one of your favorites. Yeah, Frasier. Frasier's amazing, and that's on a lot. I noticed Monk is constantly on on the Hallmark Movies and Mysteries oh, channel. Interesting. Yeah. Which I enjoy Monk. Monk's one of my favorite shows. But like, I don't know. Maybe Monk wasn't a huge show, but it was a successful show. So I don't know. Maybe maybe Monk is the closest thing to Gilligan's Island. They came by the hundreds, by the thousands, killing and crippling, creeping, crawling creatures determined to destroy the Earth. Could anything stop them? We get to our second concurrent plot, I guess we can say, because like you said, they're running simultaneously, but they never really intertwine. Mm-hmm. Where We have our two um, scientist characters. So we've got Dr. Vance, played by Steve Brody, who's a NASA scientist, who, who I agree with you, he looks like Walt Disney. <laughs> Oh, and then we've we've got Barbara Hale's Dr. Jenny Langer, and she is also a scientist. She's like a she's, local scientist, I Yeah, guess. she's kind of a local scientist. Um, she works at a telescope, I believe, that's somewhere in rural Wisconsin. And then they, they used a bunch of uh, what appear to be high school science labs oh, yeah. with some extra yes, this is equipment Yes, the classrooms that Walter in. White would teach in. Yes, yeah, exactly. To, you know, serve as their laboratories during the film so we've got dr vance we, we got to talk about how the two of them meet because oh yeah don't worry we, i'm gonna get to that okay scene. well i just <laughs> yes. i just wanted to say that like back in the day i was really into mystery science theater 3000 i've kind of lost interest in it um i've certainly not interested in it when it keeps coming back like I, I just don't like the new cast i just don't find the comic timing all that good mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. even like the old episodes like some of my favorite ones i'll still enjoy but, you know, if you just throw on a random episode, I don't think I'll enjoy it that much. I've seen this episode a number of times with Mr. Science Theater. It's been a while. I've watched it with you, I believe. Mm-hmm. You know, I hadn't seen it in a while. And there were still so many moments where it's like, I remember this joke. 
you know, right. Charles Manson jeweler was that was because I would have made that joke if they didn't. You know, there are some things <laughs> yes. that just still kind of stand out yeah. to me. But yeah. my favorite episode or my favorite part probably in that episode is the scene where these two meet because it's just so terrible like yeah, how it's, it's written it's really it's really cringy and even in 1975 oh yeah that's dated. that's the amazing part yeah. yeah so yeah vance is down in florida with nasa he he goes up to wisconsin where he meets barbara hales hales, hales character dr jenny langer and when they meet remember we're in 1975 here we have this really drawn out scene of him not getting the fact that dr langer is a woman and that he's actually already speaking to her. So there, there's a whole thing where he's like, you know, I'm here to see your husband. No, no. He says father first, which, father. which would not be my assumption looking at a 60-year-old no, woman. No, no. Where's your dead father? <laughs> he died in 1951, yeah. is line. It's not just that he's yeah. dead. It's that he died 24 yeah. years ago. <laughs> yeah. And then we have, you know, husband, brother, you know, goes through basically every possible male figure um and then, she doesn't say, he doesn't say son i don't think <laughs> that would have been funny they just draw out the joke even more <laughs> yeah which i assume the writers are in on the joke but the way the joke's delivered in the movie yes. it it doesn't really work after we get through that whole you know probably two minute long scene that didn't even need to be there uh these two embark on their investigation of what caused the whatever the anomaly is that peaked Barbara Hale's interest that mm -hmm. led her to contact Dr. Vance, which again was the meteorite crashing. Right. And then some sort of weird electromagnetic or gravitational disturbance. Whatever, whatever science-y, science fiction-y thing they there, come up some with. There's some kind of radiation it. thing going yeah. on because he yeah. mentions that he has a Geiger counter and Alan Hale's like, Geiger counter? We don't have any Geigers <laughs> around here. <laughs> yes, another another great epic Alan Hale line. Yes, <laughs> every every line of the movie he has of the movie is is a line like that. That's a good example. So yeah, then they embark on this investigation that involves some sciencing in the lab and some wandering around the farm looking for the crash site. Oh, and just as a side plot, there's some sort of weird religious revival going on in town. Yes, I'm just going to mention this. It's mostly cut out of the Mystery Science Theater version. There is more of it. Yes, yeah, there in the beginning and the end in the Mystery Science yeah. Theater movie. Or version. It doesn't really matter. It's kind of, I think, actually just running time padding. The only thing they really use it for is that Dan, you know, mm -hmm. the farmer, keeps telling his wife that he's off to the religious revival, but he's really having an affair with Helga, played by Christiane Schmittner, the uh, local bar maid, I guess is what her job is. But again, that doesn't really matter. It doesn't really have any effect on the plot at all. So eventually, the spider, one of them at least, gets to be oversized, leading to the giant spider of the title of the film. And as Patrick mentioned earlier, it's strapped onto a... What kind of car is it? Is it a Beetle? It's a Volkswagen Beetle. A Volkswagen Beetle to they make it move it around. They hide it pretty well most of the time, you know, because there's the scene where it, it stumbles upon, like, the county fair or whatever, and there's just a crowd in front of it, and that's how they kind of hide the car, Mm -hmm. But there's obviously a few moments where the car is fully visible and it's never not funny. Like, it's hilarious. <laughs> because the spider's legs look like giant... Uh, and just to give... So the whole body, the carapace, I guess we should say, of the spider, <clears throat> is basically the size of the beetle. Yeah. And then the legs, you know, project out from it, uh, you know, 10 or 15 feet probably. They look and they're like kind giant... of moving randomly. Yeah, they look really like giant give pipe the impression cleaners. The spider is actually yeah. walking. That's how we get our giant spider. Doesn't it have googly eyes too? Yeah, kind of. Depending on it when you see it, yeah, it, it doesn't. Look, it doesn't. It doesn't look good. Let's just leave it at that. But if we suspend our disbelief, we now have our giant spider wreaking havoc on this little town. And here we get back to Dan's farm with his sister-in-law, whose name is actually Terry, played okay. by D Diane Lee Hart. So here's where we get to our sexploitation scenes of the film, or at least one of them. We've got Terry in the house wearing, you know, not much. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the spider arms start bursting in through the walls and windows and whatnot, grabbing at her, 
Um, I'm pretty sure some of her already skimpy clothes get torn a bit during this scene. The walls fall down around her, and she's actually eventually killed. She does not escape. So she's killed by the giant spider. I'm pretty sure the only reason they cast her was so they could have her in this scene for this sexploitation aspect, which, you know, is pretty common in these 1970s right. B-movies. Kind of or, I mean, actually, we could, in all B-movies, including, yes. you know, current ones. <laughs> And then, yeah, the spider kind of just goes amok around town. It attacks affairs, you said. Gleason Days. <laughs> is that what it is? Because we see, we see the sign Gleason Days, like July 12th through 14th or something like that. There's a slow-pitch softball tournament, and there's food, and that's about all that Gleason... Well, they have a little one of those swing rides, I think, too. That's, like, all we see of it. I do want to point out that the 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 first shot we see of like the softball game because this is very clearly like I don't know if they made the movie because this was taking place but it's very clearly this was already taking place and they decided to just shoot part of a movie there you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's not like this isn't put on for the movie this is something that was just happening in Gleason but the first shot we see of like the slow pitch softball tournament is from the back of the bleachers and it's just like a close-up on someone's ass when they're in the stands <laughs> <laughs> like it's just a, it's like pervert cam like who's yeah. shooting this why would you shoot yeah. it this way yeah and then the camera like moves slowly out but like just just start the shot a little bit later and we don't have that like it's basically a close-up of like a denim ass pretty much yeah so eventually dan gets killed he's eaten by the spider right in a, uh, some, someone gets eaten, yeah, it's probably him. In the original, uh, the Mystery Science Theater version, the footage is so bad, sometimes you can't actually tell what's happening. Okay. Um, and that's the one I kind of remember more, because it's the one I've seen far more uh, do you, frequently. Do you which remember will... maybe if, if they, maybe the, they made it darker or something, because there was, like, a lot of blood in that scene? Because I... I'm just trying to oh, think that. Oh, that's certainly possible. I think they also just had a really bad transfer yes. in the early or the mid 90s when they're doing it. You know, I just watched it on Tubi and I don't remember the scene being particularly bloody, but Tubi is not necessarily known for having the best quality of transfers either, so <laughs> I think he's supposed to be eaten by the spider. But if you read about this online or watch it, some people think that Tan gets shoved up the spider's ass. Um, oh. Because oh, yeah, yeah. there's basically just this big hole in the yes. spider suit, and it's unclear if it's the mouth or the anus. But one way or the other, Dan kind of gets shoved into it or pulled up into it because that's actually what it looks like. You know, he's supposed to be getting eaten, but there's clearly people in the costume just right. pulling him up through the right. hole. And can I, can I say one more thing about oh, Dan? Oh, sure, I sure. Mean, we go, we go. just lost him, but. Yeah. There's something that, at at least two points in the movie, he's leaving his mistress's house or whatever. And one mm-hmm. time he's leaving and she's like, wait, you forgot this. And then she hands him the girdle, which he puts around his waist. Yes, yeah. And then the other time he's leaving, she's like, wait, you forgot something. And he's like, no, no, no I already have it. Like, he refers to his girdle. <laughs> right. Then she gives him, like, a bag. And it, isn't that of drugs? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I thought is he like a drug dealer or something? I think there's something about that. Like it's it's really that's like the only I pretty sure she hands him a bag of drugs, but I don't remember. Mm. You know, if if that is the case it doesn't go anywhere. But he certainly seems like the sleazeball type that would deal drugs in rural wisconsin or whatever you know but <laughs> yeah you you'd know more about that than i would well you know uh, i <laughs> not implying anything about you but as living in wisconsin <laughs> right I'm well sure i don't you live would... in rural I, I, that's another thing i want to say is that <laughs> gleason wisconsin if, if you have any kind of indication of wisconsin when you think wisconsin i think you generally think rural mm-hmm. but i live in suburban milwaukee which is like any other suburban area. It's it's very normal. You you go further north, you go up to, you know, Gleason, Rhinelander, that area is like it's like the middle of nowhere there. I can't even really imagine what it, what it's like out there. You know, it's I don't really have experience with that, but I, Yeah, that's I, that's fair. I mean, like, you know, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, which has a very kind of similar dynamic. Uh, yes. You know, we've, you've got greater philly and greater pittsburgh and then the rest of the state which is gets very rural very quickly basically Mm -hmm, when you leave the metro areas and that's i i do want to mention a couple things just relevant to my life so i was born in appleton which is near green bay so it's further north than where i am now but it's also they mention oshkosh a few times in this movie because scientist lady has a brother in oshkosh i think she says he's an interior decorator except 
the the audio is so bad. I thought she said Oshawa, which is mm. in which is a suburban Toronto. Mm-hmm. But later on, when they meet Alan Hale, he's like, "Oh, is this your brother from Oshkosh?" And it's like, "Okay, it was Oshkosh. I thought it was. I like rewound it to to make sure it mm, was Oshkosh. Yeah, yeah, and I couldn't hear it. Oshkosh is pretty close to Appleton, where I'm from. It's known as Osh Vegas to to those in the know because if you drive through the main part of the city on the highway, there's this big sign. It's in the style of the Las Vegas, the Welcome to Las Vegas sign, and it's mm. just like Welcome to Fabulous Osh Vegas, and it's like okay, and that's so. So I got excited. There's a little yeah Osh Vegas. I, I assume that the chain still exists. I haven't seen it in a long time, but Oshkosh Bagash used to yes. be a yeah yeah, and it's from there. Obviously, yeah yes. yeah, a well known. Basically, mall ch- mall chain, I guess. Dan gets killed either by you know being eaten by the spider, which I think is what they were trying to do, or what it appears actually happens is he gets shoved up the spider's anus. Uh, either way, I think we can agree it's a bad way to go. Although a more fitting way for such a disgusting character would be the anus shoving. <laughs> it would it would. We then get to kind of the the grand finale of the film. It's not a very long film, by the way. It might seem like we've gone through it rather quickly, but it is only 84 minutes. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of drawn-out scenes where not much happens. And like I said, there's three or four scenes involving this religious revival, which really just doesn't even serve much purpose to the plot. It's it's just a a fire and brimstone type preacher. They refer to it a few times, like that uh, Alan Hale's been getting calls complaining about him disturbing the peace and stuff like that. That's kind of as far as that goes. Yeah, and if we want to go more into that than even probably the film intended. I think he does talk about, you know, kind of the, the end of DeHimes and the, mm-hmm. the actual literal fire and brimstone and yeah. you know, the the spiders are coming to earth literally kind of is fire and brimstone. So yeah. maybe that was I mean, there's, intended there's a very, or maybe... There's a loose connection there. But there's no there's no thematic connection. No, I mean we're giving the film more credit than yeah. actually is due. It's it's like Planet of the Apes has the religious zealot, but that's like part of the film. That's what the film's commenting on. This isn't really commenting on no, no, the it's religious just, revival, it's, revival. Yeah. it's just kind of using that yeah. as like, a, oh, isn't that cute? Because there is an actual disaster. Yeah, so then we get to the final um, part of the film where we have our NASA scientists basically save the day. They find out where the spider originated from, and they end up somehow supposedly sealing the gateway and, you know, saving the day. Although the film ends very, very abruptly. Yes. I think it's not really exactly clear at the end what happens. So I originally saw this film in, it was 2003 or 2004. It was during my first year of undergrad. I saw it with my one friend who introduced me to a lot of these Mystery Science Theater right. movies. And so he had a, a VHS copy recorded off a local Scranton TV station. Okay. Um, so it was a bad mm-hmm. airing of an already bad film. And we <laughs> always thought that there's a final shootout between the police officer and the spider. And it's kind of a rather big police officer, but it's really dark, really grainy. We always thought it was Alan Hale that was in this shootout with the spider and then gets killed. But in the Blu-ray transfer, it's very clearly a totally different police officer who we've never met before that has a mustache. Yeah, so, oh, so he has a mustache. I was going to say, were they trying to pass him off as maybe no, it's Alan Hale? No, that's the thing. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, I would think in, this, in 1975, in the theaters, you would have seen clearly that it wasn't Alan Hale. Well, also, you say in the theaters, this was very clearly a drive-in movie, too. This was seen in the drive-ins. That's why it was a big hit, it's because drive-ins were still relatively big in the 70s. They weren't as big mm-hmm, as they were mm-hmm. in preceding decades, but they're certainly bigger than they are now. And this was a movie... I don't know if it would have played in indoor theaters at all. This was like a just a piece of shit movie that you throw on and the, the second half of a drive-in, you know, double feature kind of thing. I, yeah. I think. Although according to Wikipedia, on its three hundred thousand dollar budget, yeah. it had a box office of fifteen million. It made a lot of money, and I think it, there was a time in the seventies when some kind of nonsensical movies could make a lot of money, really because of drive-ins. I think mm-hmm. the classic example, and there's another mystery science theater connection here is the what's it oh the the legend of boggy creek the original film which was an early 70s film oh right was a big hit in drive-ins that was like a top 10 grossing movie of the year and it was made for like probably a similar budget to this maybe even lower 
And I, I'm willing to bet that did not show at any indoor, you know, movie palace kind of thing. It was just right. It was, it was a big just hit drive-ins. in rural yeah. areas, and yeah. So it's like movies could be successful just off of that back then, you know. Yeah, and I, clearly, you know, it, it was some sort of a hit at least because uh, it did make. Wikipedia you know, mentions it was a, a top fifty grossing movie of the year, which doesn't sound that impressive. <laughs> no, because in nineteen seventy, there would have been a lot less movies coming out. Well, every yeah, year exactly. Too. But also, like top yeah. fifty, that's like a big, it's <laughs> a big number. Yeah, you it's know? not like, like it's top fifty of all time or of the century. Yeah, it's and and if year, it's yeah. and especially if it's if it's let's say it's number twenty three, you would not want to say it's top fifty. You would want to say, say it's, it's top, top twenty five or top yeah, thirty. Exactly. Or, yeah, know. so it's clearly like number forty eight or something. Uh, you like would that. think yes. So anyway, uh, just to to close out this finale here. So we always thought it was Alan Hale that was kind of in this heroic ending shootout, which if you see a grainy version, you still might see that. I think to original audiences, it was clear it wasn't Alan Hale because even in a drive-in, they would have been able to see the original footage more clearly than like a a A VHS transfer of uh, something aired on a local TV station 20 years later. That's probably been copied who knows how many times. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about that is we don't actually have an ending for Alan Hale's character. He just (sighs) disappears uh, and we never see him again. And I don't mean disappears as in it's a mystery what happened to him. His character just kind of fades away and the movie ends. The last time we see him, I think, is when he confronts the angry mob. Yeah, and that's it. He doesn't do anything. (laughs) So the character that ties all the other plots together doesn't actually have a resolution or <laughs> any heroic ending or anything like that. Now, here, here's the question. Would you rather see Alan Hale be the hero in the end, or would you rather see him die? Because they probably should have done one of the two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something. Should have, they should have done something, yes. Something, anything, yeah. Maybe he had to leave filming, or, you know, it's a mystery we'll never know, uh, at least not with what we have available to us. And I haven't done that much research into it, but I'm not sure it'll ever be answerable but yeah his character should have had some ending well you would you would almost think because you're watching the first half of this movie first half hour of this movie or so every scene of him is he's just in his office he's on the phone Mm -hmm. so he's not even talking to anyone he's not even in scenes with anyone and you think like okay they had him for a day and they just shot all the scenes but no he goes to the restaurant and he meets the two scientists and he goes to the angry mob and confronts them Mm -hmm. so they had him Mm -hmm. for more than a day yeah or, or more than an hour, I should say. Maybe those were all the same day, who knows? Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, I don't know. If we were to refilm this with kind of present-day sensibilities, I can imagine it ends exactly the same way, and then we have a mid credit scene or an end credit scene that just shows him <laughs> kind of sleeping in his office in his chair, <laughs> or, you know, like back, at, back at the diner, like, having a piece of pie while the people sure. are running by in the background... You know, outside okay. the window. Make it into like, like a that. comedy thing. Like yeah. in the Airplane, there's a <laughs> yes. end credits thing where they cut back to the guy who Robert Hayes left in the taxi cab just checking his watch. Yes, as, as yeah, it. yeah, exactly. I think that would be a fitting ending for Alan Hale's character. You know, I don't hate, hate Alan Hale, so I don't wish him dead. You know, he, now he's been dead in real life for 30-some years, but I don't think I need him to be killed by the spider I think right. I of, just think they should have done something. Yeah, no, it would have been actually interesting. I think I, I kind of like the idea better if he had been that final police officer that gets in this right. rogue shootout. Yeah, it makes more sense. Whether he's killed or not, you know, he puts up a valiant fight. Or we have this, you know, kind of joke ending with him that I imagine, <laughs> yeah. uh, where he's just, you know, eating pie at the diner. Well, and that's and that's you're fully embracing the camp of the movie. Yes, the movie yeah, never really true. does. No, the movie no. is camp. Yeah. Sort it does. Of. It does try to play itself very straight. Um, yeah. Although we've got Alan Hale hamming it up the whole time. But yes, that's, that's the very part. incongruous. He is the jokey part. Yeah, yeah, but it's very incongruous with the rest of the film. So yeah, then the film just kind of abruptly ends and it's over. The NASA scientists kind of save the day and get the preacher speaking over the credits. Yeah, and then Dan is dead inside the the spider's body. Does somewhere. his wife die? I don't think we get resolution for her either. Actually. Probably died of liver disease. Yeah, or something. yeah. She she dies of cirrhosis. Her her younger sister, you know, is killed by the spider. Dan's eaten by the spider. The jeweler is killed because a spider gets in his car. Yeah, yeah. And that scene was weird because they um 
appeared to use women's screaming sound effects. <laughs> I don't know if they did, but that's yeah. what it sounded like. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's the film. That's Giant Spider Invasion. I know we've both seen it before, including yes. uh, having watched it together, but your thoughts? Would you recommend it? I don't know, whatever other that's, questions yeah, you that's normally a, ask here. Right, yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, do I like it, do I not? Because obviously it's a bad movie. I think as a bad movie, it has some redeeming qualities that make it fun. But it also, you know, I, I do have mixed feelings about it because I like the idea of this. It's It's like a... 70s update on like the 50s monster movie the 50s sci-fi horror monster movie it's an alien invasion Mm -hmm. it's a giant spider it's it's the giant gila monster for the 70s except they don't really do anything to update the formula uh there's a little bit of more a little bit more sleaze with the the sister-in-law and there's like a tiny bit more but not really like anything to really make it feel kind of different than an old 50s movie it's even got the radiation kind of aspect yes. thrown in. That having been said, the the aspects of the movie that I really enjoy are the, the 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 some of the feel of it, where it feels like these people just got together and put on a movie. You know, the, the some of the ugly homegrown qualities of the movie. I guess the fact that it just takes place in rural Wisconsin is is awesome to me. <laughs> Regardless of me being from Wisconsin, that's just like. You don't shoot movies just in the middle of nowhere, but Bill mm-hmm. Urbane did, and I respect mm-hmm. that. Um, and most of the actors, I mean, obviously we know who Alan Hale is. The two lead scientists uh, we mentioned aren't nobodies, but it's like I don't really recognize anyone, and, and it would you would think half these people are just like local people, and they're not. But... You know, who's the, the man of a thousand voices? Like Yeah, Robert Easton, yeah. Like, even though I didn't, I didn't actually know who he was on site, right. but... He has an extensive filmography. Yeah, he just looks like he would be a local guy because he just has that look. He doesn't look like an actor. He just looks like this disgusting local guy. And that's, it's like him playing a major role, I think, is interesting. It's maybe, it's arguably less interesting when you actually find out that he is a real actor. It's arguably more interesting because he is so convincing as this just sleazebag. Not that it's like a great performance by any means. I'm just looking through his filmography now. Since you mentioned the Star Trek Four earlier, um, is he in that? No, he's in Star Trek Six as the Klingon judge. Oh, the bad one. No, no, Five's the bad one. I I oh no, you're the... right. Star Trek Six is pretty good. So actually, the Klingon judge has this very kind of gravelly voice. You don't actually see his face, um, but he's the judge that passes the sentence on Kirk and McCoy. Um, but you can kind of get the whole man of a thousand voices there because the judge okay. is this very kind He's of. He's in Pet Cemetery too. Okay. Beverly Hillbillies movie from the nineties. Yeah, he's in a lot, and this is just on Wikipedia. There's actually just his selected filmography, yes, which means he so... had a lot of roles. Yeah, exactly. He's in Primary Colors, the movie where John Travolta plays like a Bill a Clinton, Bill Clinton type. analog. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's in Gods and Generals, a. Uh... 2003 Civil War One of the film biggest flops in movie yeah, history, I believe. Exactly, Although it's, yes. everyone says it's pretty good, I want to say. Oh, yeah, I don't think it's good. Oh, um, maybe I'm thinking of something else then. I know. Well, it is the pre- it's the prequel to Gettysburg, which is actually is a, good, a good movie. Okay, I didn't know there was any connection between the movies. No, yes, I know no, Gettysburg it's, is It is, good. it's the prequel, made ten years later. Uh, but it's known for having a very out of place kind of pro confederacy slant to it. Oh no! Which, which even in two thousand three was, you know, not kosher. And today, oh, course, you know, yeah. twenty years later, it's even more noticeably kind of cringy. Yeah, there's okay. several scenes in the film, and remember, this is a two thousand three film that have slaves talking about how well they're treated and oh, how. No. Things like that. So yeah, it's it's not good. <laughs> Planet of the Apes was more uh, sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, as as far as like these kinds of really low budget seventies kind of exploitation movies, Giant Spider Invasion is far from my favorite. I even enjoy something like Grizzly more, which Grizzly is a bigger budgeted movie. Mm. I just I, I don't know, but like the aspects of it that I enjoyed are the. Alan Hale having no idea what movie he's in. I think that's just very enjoyable. There's a scene even late in the movie where he gets a phone call about a giant spider in Gleason, which is like the next town over. And he's like getting ready to go there. And then his phone rings 
and and it's one thing if he goes and picks up the phone but he actually sits down <laughs> like no he's ready to leave because there's a giant spider but he's just like he's alan hale he's he's out of shape and he just needs to sit down like i, yeah. I find that stuff really funny yeah but yeah so i like those kinds of aspects about it but there are other b movies that do it better yeah the galaxy invader i mm. think is even better than this even you know, better sleazy character and then just more kind of interesting grizzly a little less sleazy than this but i think just more enjoyable for me night beast which is by the same filmmaker as the galaxy invader i think is very entertaining yeah other movies do it better but this is you know if you like this kind of b movie like you can do worse you know the movie itself is kind of eh yeah but it is one of my favorite mystery science theater episodes i remember it being a good one yeah i think the commentary is particularly well done they really roast the shit out of the film and it deserves it for the most part. oh yeah and i remember they they were pretty harsh on alan hale and oh yeah yeah a friend of mine he thought kind of the difference of the mike and the joel episodes like the later episodes with mike mm-hmm. as being a bit more kind of harsher on actors and like personalities yes than the yeah. earlier ones and i think that's true and for the most part i think that that's kind of what i enjoyed like i enjoyed them really digging into um jodan baker like some of that stuff is hilarious yeah there's one particularly kind of memorable scene in the mystery science theater f- version where there's there's a really weird cut where it just shows alan hale kind of just giggling and then it cuts oh yes to something else and in the Mystery <laughs> Science Theater version, they just have kind of the internal monologue of Alan Hale, and they imagine he's just thinking to himself, pudding! And yeah. he's, he's just so excited about the idea of pudding that he's just kind of giggling. And the funny it. thing is, like, <laughs> the funny thing about that is that that's not out of place to anything that he's... If he were to no, say it actually that in the fits movie, with his character. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, yeah. That's Giant Spider Invasion. That's all I really have to say about it as well. Right. Uh, You know, like I said, the movie itself is eh. I enjoy the Mystery Science Theater version. It is one of my favorites. Um, Yeah, maybe I'll have to go back and rewatch that episode and see if it kind of holds up for me. Because I I already know a lot of the episodes don't, but I think some of the ones that I thought were my favorites at the time still do hold up. Like, I love the Soul Taker episode still, Yes. you know. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's the thing with Mystery Science Theater, I think. There's, you know, even just the original series, I think there's 11 seasons. Yeah. And I haven't, I mean, honestly, I haven't seen a lot of them. There's so many episodes. There's so many. But the ones that are good are really good. 8 out of 10 might be totally forgettable. 1 out of 10 might be just boring. But then that other 1 out of 10 is really good. And yeah, it's still good, fair. you know, it's still good 25 years later, I think. And this is one of those, I would say. Okay, okay, so I'll have to go back and rewatch that. Now, Sean, which of these two movies do you prefer? So we know which is the better movie, but which oh. do you just enjoy watching more? You know, I've probably seen Giant Spider Invasion more often in terms of just overall fun. It's a yeah. good movie, especially if you've been, you know, doing a bit of drinking. <laughs> as the characters it's a, it's a in the Wisconsin film Wisconsin film yeah, that's fitting yeah, yes yeah yeah have your fits. morning margarita and watch <laughs> exactly. this movie at 10 a.m you know it's it's fun with friends it's not as fun to watch on your own I would oh, say oh yeah but as a term kind of a, a kind of a, a group movie to watch for fun you know with some alcohol or other substances it's a good time <laughs> you know Planet of the Apes is a good movie but it's not all that fun to watch again. Okay. You know, I would say, you know, it's fun to see it a couple times with some years in between the viewings, but it's not really kind of a, a repeat Okay. watch over and over again. What do you think? Well, I feel like that didn't really answer the question, to be perfectly honest, but I will <laughs> answer the question anyways. No, no. Uh, between the two, I would rather watch Giant Spider Invasion. Okay. All right. There yeah, we go. Yeah. But... I would I, I would actually disagree with some of the stuff you said about okay, Planet of the Apes. Yeah, I don't no, necessarily shoot. disagree with anything you said about Giant Spider Invasion. Reasonably fun, definitely more fun with the crowd. That's overall what I've noticed about the Mystery Science Theater 3000 episodes, too, is that I first watched... I didn't have, like, a friend get me into the show. I started watching them on YouTube on my own. I thought okay. they were great. Yeah. Then I started watching them with people, 
Mm-hmm. And now I can't watch them alone. Like I enjoy them more with with. Yeah, no, people, totally, but... totally agree. I haven't watched one by myself in a long time. Okay, but I, I will say I think Planet of the Apes to me is a valuable rewatch because because the storytelling is so good and mm-hmm. the message is is or the messages are still relevant that like to me I, I agree it's not like the most entertaining like you know it's not action packed it's not hilarious it's it's a little silly parts of dated but you know I, to me it's it's still a very rewarding watch I think I like it a bit more each time I see it mm-hmm. so I, I, I will I'll come back to Planet of the Apes every year or so and rewatch it and, and still enjoy it I think and uh, you know so as so I do I do find the movie much more entertaining not that I don't enjoy the giant spider invasion for certain aspects to it but just as the overall experience I find Planet of the Apes much more rewarding I suppose rewarding maybe not the right word because what's rewarding about giant spider invasion that's not really fair but just a more <laughs> in, in, engaging more entertaining experience I guess you know it's it's a, a 20 or 30 minutes longer but that doesn't matter if the storytelling is good and if you're really into the story, you know, so. Yeah. So here comes the question. How do these hold up, these two movies together, hold up as a drive-in double feature? That is a good question. I think we had an easier time with it in the prior episode that I guessed it on because we said they were kind of, yeah, Godzilla and uh, Killing American Style because they actually did kind of have the similar theme of having escaped convicts wreaking havoc. And I think... You know, there are some similarities between these two movies as well. The big one is is the religious angle. I I, I mentioned Planet of the Apes yeah, does that's something true. That's true. with the religion, yeah. whereas mm-hmm. Giant Spider Invasion doesn't. It just mm-hmm. kind of has it mm-hmm. in there. But there is that. There's that. Yeah, and they line. both they both also definitely have kind of this Cold War, a little bit of Cold War sci-fi. Yeah, sci-fi and kind of warnings about you know whether it is. Uh, the religious aspect you just mentioned, some warnings about kind of the mixtures of, you know, religion with state, with science, things like that. They both also have kind of a bit of this kind of science warning, you know, warnings of, you know, nuclear stuff gone too far, you know, space kind of concerns, things like that. But really, I think, other than the fact that they're both kind of science fiction SF films mm-hmm. of the kind of a similar era, although one's late 60s and one's mid 70s. And when you get low budget mid 70s, though, it plays like it's 10 years <laughs> it earlier. It rewinds now, you know? it a bit. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I'm going to say there's one more thing that these okay. have in common. I okay. just thought of it, but now I've yeah. already forgotten about it. So let me think. Because okay. I think it was relevant to pointing out. It, it wasn't this, but I would say government ineptitude whether it's alan mm, hale mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. <laughs> alan hale just sitting down on his chair doing telling people to let your fingers do the walking or um you know the government <laughs> the, the yellow H pages yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 um but no there was something else what was it oh i remember so planet of the apes is rated g giant spider invasion is rated pg both films contain far more nudity than those ratings would allow today. <laughs> oh, that's true. There's that's a true. lot of ass shots in Planet of the Apes because they go skinny dipping. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And then there's boobs in the giant spider invasion and in a PG film. So it was just a different era back then. Yeah, but I thought was. that was kind of worth noting. <laughs> no, it is. And it is. And we're also, you know, I'm sure most of the people listening to this already know this, uh, but we are in the kind of pre PG thirteen era for yes. both pre PG era probably for Planet of the Apes. I That's guess, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I when you had the option of it either being G or R, I've always found it confusing. You know, sometimes when things get re released on DVD and stuff, sometimes they update the ratings, sometimes they don't. Mm-hmm, it always mm-hmm. bothered me because like the Dollars trilogy. When I when I first started getting into those movies, I wanted to rent them from the library but i wasn't 17 and i couldn't because they were marked as r-rated and it's like those movies would not be r-rated today they'd be like a mild Mm pg-13 and it's like planet of the apes should be updated to a pg giant spider invasion i guess to a pg-13 i mean listen nobody's gonna care too much about a re-release of giant spider invasion changing the rating but i think i think there needs to be some kind of Board, maybe there is, but they just they're just not consistent yeah. in terms of like no, re- the, uh, and yeah, I think that is actually because I've seen I've seen Psycho, you know, the Alfred Hitchcock Psycho. I've seen. 
that on DVD is listed as like PG-13. And it's like, okay, PG-13 did not exist in 1960. So that's obviously yeah, so an updated, updated rating. Right. But, but actually, even raising this, I think it's actually an interesting point. Just the kind of this drift that's happened in the ratings over time, which is, you know, just kind of a, an interesting thing to think about it in general. Also, arguably, due to the religious z- Yeah, that's true. Zealots Going back of to the, the kind films of that we see the, revive, in these the revival of evangelicalism yes. and, yeah, all these things. Yeah, definitely. That, which is, you know, again, tied into the film. So we can end on that amazing, you know, kind of revelation, or yeah. we could also just think about where this goes further and things like that. All right. Well, in conclusion, I think this is a good double feature. I mean, it's not a perfect one, obviously, but I do like you get the A movie that's, you know, maybe aged, but it's a classic and it's a, maybe a bit of a cult movie just because it's kind of weird mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's ape makeup and stuff like that. But we didn't even mention, I think it's John Chambers. The guy who did the makeup was the guy in Argo, with the I think the Alan Arkin character, the cia oh hero. i didn't know that <laughs> yeah yeah interesting interesting um that's yeah so he's like a hero behind the scenes and then a hero i guess behind the scenes of the movie no 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 too, wait but... wait wait. it's not alan arkin's is character. it goodman it's it's john goodman's character okay yes, i couldn't yes. i haven't seen argo in a long time but okay well i love john goodman so that makes i me also love better. john goodman yeah. and he's but, gone through like five careers yeah and uh we're doing arachnophobia in a few weeks so that's a classic john Ooh, goodman yes role, yes but... yes but yeah, so I, I think it's a good um, double feature where you see a classic movie, you see a B movie, and th- they're enjoyable for different reasons, and they're not going to be necessarily enjoyable to the same people, but if you're someone like me who has an appreciation for a well-told story like the original Planet of the Apes, who can put up with a bit of the 60s, a little 60s nonsense, I guess, mm-hmm. whether it's the very mild hippie stuff with... Um, lucius or just the kind of the goofiness of the overall story and then if you enjoy like a good 70s low budget exploitation kind of movie like giant spider invasion is you know as as a not good movie is interesting for all these kinds of other reasons so i think together decent to good double feature not a great one but you know i'll I'll, I'll, it gets my vote of approval very good all right, thank you for joining me, Sean. Please remind us the podcast that you are on. Thank you for having me. The, the podcast officially has several names. <laughs> yes, that's, that's why I needed you to remind us. <laughs> it is Monster Club. It is Monster Club TM with the trademark symbol. It is Monster Club Lunch Break Hot Takes. Although I am very clearly Sean here, and Sean is my real name. Kind of the gimmick or... Um, Part of the fun of our podcast is we constantly change our names and we have names that usually refer to the different films and would you have gone by skipper and... for this episode oh yeah probably or at i least... would have taken cornelius i think <laughs> that's a good one too uh, i would have gone by skipper or jonas because as i've said jonas grumby is the skipper's real name and it's, it's always mm-hmm. a good party thing to know <laughs> i learned something today <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that is um, uh, our podcast, and we talk about monster films of um, varieties, uh, different different types, different, um, they're not always sci-fi. Yeah, I feel like either one of these movies that we did could could be covered by your podcast, you know? Yes, although one of the other um, co-hosts, whose real name is Ben, but who also goes under very many yes. changing aliases, he told us we were doing too many apes. So, all right, thanks thanks again, Sean. And next week, I'm going to be joined by my friend Josh as we discuss Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, and Death Wish from 1974, starring the great Charles Bronson. So be sure to tune in next week. Be sure to check out our Patreon for extended cuts of episodes as well as early releases and commentary tracks. And uh, follow us on Twitter at Drive In Podcast to check out any news or updates. And we hope to we hope to see you again. <laughs> <laughs>